All right, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about infiltration excess overland flow. So this type of stream flow generation occurs when it is raining harder than water can soak into the ground. So rainfall intensity is greater than the infiltration capacity. So in this illustration, it's raining on this bedrock surface. Water can't infiltrate into the bedrock. So it's running off over land into the stream here. More commonly, we get infiltration excess overland flow, even in situations where some water can make it into the ground. Picture a very clay rich soil uh, or a sidewalk with cracks in it. There's some water that can infiltrate, uh, but rainfall rate is still greater than that infiltration capacity. And so the water that can't infiltrate moves over the land surface and into the stream. To put it mathematically, the volume of overland flow, so running over the land surface at a given time, is a function of the water input rate, W of T, so that's the rainfall rate, minus the infiltration rate, F of T. So this infiltration excess overland flow was one of the first conceptualizations of how uh, water got to streams and the pivotal work on this conceptualization of this was done by a man named Robert Horton in the 1930s. So sometimes we also call this Hortonian overland flow or HOF in honor of Robert Horton. I prefer infiltration excess overland flow because that tells you what it really is, not just who it's named for. All right, so to illustrate this a little further, this is an animation sequence here created by Todd Walter and his group at Cornell. Uh, the link is down at the bottom. So we have a soil. Uh, it's raining on the soil. And in the initial picture, we've got rain over here as this blue column and infiltration capacity as the red line. Uh, at first, our rain rate is less than our infiltration capacity, which means that all of the water soaks into the ground. But as rain continues, even if it's raining at the same rate, if the infiltration capacity is declining over time, which it tends to do in natural soils, then we start to see some water that can't infiltrate into the ground. It starts to pond on the land surface. And if your land surface has any sort of slope whatsoever, it's going to run downhill as illustrated by this yellow line. And so that's the beginning of our infiltration excess over land flow. As the rain continues, the infiltration excess over land flow continues and it gets um, larger in volume if the infiltration capacity continues to decline, even if the rainfall rate is constant or maybe even slightly declining as shown up here. Uh, and again, the bigger the difference between infiltration capacity and rainfall rate, the more infiltration excess over land flow that we're gonna generate. At the end of the storm, as rainfall rate drops off to zero, the hill slope drains. Some water continues to come from the top part of the hill slope down to the bottom of the hill slope, but infiltration excess overland flow ends pretty quickly at the end of a storm. There we can see it kind of dropping off. It continues to be large and at the end of the storm, it goes to zero. Here's how we could kind of illustrate this mathematically. Again, we can take this equation here where overland flow at a given time is a function of the water input rate minus the infiltration rate. So the water input rate, the infiltration rate, and the overland flow rate at any point in time are illustrated on the y-axis. No numbers, pick your own numbers. This is a conceptual diagram. And then over here we have time from the beginning of the storm. So notice that our water input rate is constant through the whole storm. All right, so it's just raining at a constant rate. And at the beginning of the storm, our infiltration capacity might be greater than our water infiltration or our water input rate. So that means that our infiltration rate is equal to our water input rate. But as our infiltration capacity declines over the course of the storm, at some point it becomes lower than the water input rate. And at that point, that's when we start to get ponding on the land surface and then overland flow increasing. So if you add it up, the amount of overland flow um, at any point in time and the infiltration uh, rate at that point in time, you would equal the water input rate. 
Let's look at this with a little bit more realistic data. This is an illustration from the original paper where Horton came up with this idea. So kind of a complicated graph, but up here we have the rainfall intensity and the infiltration rate. So here is our graph of infiltration capacity, or F of T. It starts out constant and then declines over the course of the storm, maybe eventually reaching some sort of flatline equilibrium infiltration capacity. But maybe the storm quits before we get there. And in this storm, our rainfall starts out kind of lightly and then gets very intense, has some variation to it, and then goes to zero. So at the beginning of the storm, our rainfall rate is low and our infiltration capacity is high. So if we go down to the bottom graph, we see a runoff rate. And here our runoff rate is zero or close to zero because all of the water can be infiltrated. Then when it starts to rain really hard, um, as illustrated in black here, the rainfall rate is suddenly much greater than our infiltration capacity, and this is when ponding occurs. And at this point, uh, we are sort of filling up little depressions and microtopography on the land surface, so this is our ponding time. But again, any time your land has any slope whatsoever, at some point those little microtopography depressions are going to start to fill and spill and run off down slope. And so here we can see the surface detention storage kind of fills up. And as it fills, we start to generate runoff. Um, and again, here our rainfall rate is higher than our infiltration capacity. Now at some point, the storm ends, rainfall goes to zero. And we see at that point, um, we still continue to produce runoff for a while, our surface detention drains, but the whole thing is over pretty quickly. Notice that this is a really intense rainstorm here. It's raining 10 centimeters per hour for a few minutes, but the whole thing is over in less than an hour. All right, so where does infiltration excess overland flow occur? It occurs in impermeable areas. So in the field of urban hydrology, this is really important because a rooftop or a driveway or a parking lot or a street, those are all places designed not to allow infiltration to occur. And so when it rains, we get infiltration excess overland flow. It can also occur in compacted soils. So if you've ever cut across a footpath that isn't paved, but lots of people walk on it, if you ever do that during a rainstorm, what you'll notice is that there's often flow on the land surface there, even though it's not in the adjacent areas that aren't on the path. And that's the compaction caused by everybody's feet. Uh, hydrophobic soils, for example, after a wildfire where they are actively repelling water, that means it's pretty hard to infiltrate water into those landscapes, so you get infiltration excess overland flow. Uh, really clay-rich or silty clay soils that don't have a lot of macropores in them, those are other places where we do still get some infiltration, but our infiltration capacity is low, so if it's raining hard enough, then you get infiltration excess overland flow. And finally, semi-arid and arid areas with intense rainfall. So here it's not so much about the soil properties, like it is in all the ones above, but it's about this intense rainfall. So even if you have a pretty decent soil, a sandy soil or a loamy soil, if it's raining hard enough, then you can still get infiltration excess over land flow. So in these semi-arid and arid areas, it doesn't rain very often, but when it does, man, it really comes down and we can generate this over land flow. Um, even though it occurs in all sorts of different areas, it's almost never uniform over a surface. Again, picture a sidewalk or a driveway. There are cracks in it. Those are places where infiltration is occurring at a higher rate, and maybe we're not generating overland flow from it. Or right off the sides of your sidewalk or driveway. Those are places where infiltration can occur and won't generate um, overland flow. The same is true in natural landscapes. You might have a bedrock outcrop that's generating infiltration excess overland flow, but the adjacent areas where bedrock is not exposed right at the land surface might not be. So it's very rare to have a whole watershed producing infiltration excess overland flow um, at any given time or basically ever. 
Um, one place or a place that is near and dear to many of our hearts where we don't see a lot of infiltration excess overland flow in wildland areas um, are humid and densely vegetated areas, places like Ohio um, and places like upstate New York. So that's the fun fact. Robert Horton was doing his work and coming up with his conceptualization of how water gets to the streams at his laboratory in upstate New York in a place where on natural surfaces, infiltration excess over land flow is pretty uncommon. But it does happen, um, again, particularly in disturbed landscapes. So this is a photo from Parma, Ohio, just south of Cleveland. This is in the West Creek Reservation of Cleveland Metro Parks during an intense rainstorm in April 2017. You see water ponding on the trail here. It's probably running off this direction. So that's infiltration, excess overland flow on an impervious surface. But check out this part of the hill slope over here. It's really muddy water. It's coming down, kind of channelizing and going into this wetland here. Um, the reason we're generating a lot of overland flow off of this part of the hill slope and not say over here is that this is a um, former landfill site. And in order to prevent um, leaching into the landfill and pollution associated with the landfill, it's capped with a clay liner and compacted. So basically they've done everything possible to keep water from getting into the ground, uh, which means that when it rains hard, it generates a lot of infiltration excess over land flow. And unfortunately that comes down and impacts this wetland here. So that's it for infiltration excess overland flow, otherwise known as Hortonian overland flow.